uh, high finite math people and welcome to our second lecture on logic. Uh, let's just review what we did in the first lecture, okay? In the first lecture, we defined something called a statement. And we said that a statement is a phrase or a sentence that is either true or false, but not both. Uh, for example, the sentence, I am 27 feet tall, is a statement because either it's true that I am 27 feet tall or it's false that I am 27 feet tall and it can't be both. Uh, the statement that I am 27 feet tall can't be both true or false, but it definitely is one or the other. A compound statement is a statement that is made up of two or more other statements that are joined together by connectives, words such as and, or, or but. So a compound statement is a statement that's made up of two or more other statements. A simple statement is a statement that cannot be analyzed as being made up of two or more other statements. A simple statement expresses one thought, and we can't look at it and say, oh, see this simple statement here? It was made up by joining this statement and that statement. Not with a simple statement, we can't do that. We can't look at a simple statement and say, oh, it was made up of this statement and this statement. So a simple statement expresses one thought, and we can't analyze it as being made up of two other or two or more other statements put together. Next thing on our list, and I've inserted the word simple here for a reason. Simple statements are represented symbolically by lowercase letters. Uh, most often we use letters P, Q, R, S, and T. Uh, to denote simple statements. Uh, we don't have to restrict uh, our representation of simple statements using these letters, but for some reason or other, uh, typically we use the letters P, Q, R, and if we need more letters, we add S and T to the cast. Uh, the connectives and but and or are represented symbolically by the following symbols. Uh, the connective and is represented by this thing that looks like an upside down B. The connective but is represented by the same exact symbol, this symbol that looks like an upside down B. And the reason is we're going to find out that Logically, the words and and but pretty much mean the same thing. The connective or is represented by this symbol that looks like a V. Now, there are a couple of other things that we discussed in our first lecture on logic. Uh, one of those things has to do with the negation. Uh, of a statement. And we'll look at those things uh, next. Okay, some more things to look at. Uh, the negation of a statement is a modification of the statement such that the truth values, true or false, of the modified statement is or are the opposite of the truth values of the original statement. So let me say that again in the singular and let me say that again in the plural. The negation of a statement is a modification of the statement such that the truth value of the modified statement is the opposite of the truth value of the original statement or using the plural, 
The negation of a statement is a modification of the statement such that the truth values of the modified statement are the opposite of the truth values of the original statement. Here's an example. The statement, I am exactly 23 years old. And that is a statement. Uh, either it's true that I am exactly 23 years old, or it's false that I am exactly 23 years old, and it's not both. So this is a statement. The negation of this statement is this. I am not exactly 23 years old. And here's why. If this statement, the original statement is true, I am exactly 23 years old, uh, then it's not true that I am not exactly 23 years old. It's false that I am not exactly 23 years old. So if the original statement is true, this statement is false. But suppose that this statement is false. The original statement is false. The statement, I am exactly 23 years old, is false. That means that I'm not exactly 23 years old. And so the statement, I am not exactly 23 years old, is true. So if the original statement is false, then the negation is true. Given a statement represented symbolically with the letter P, the negation of P is represented represented symbolically as a P with this squiggly symbol in front of it. Uh, there is a name for this symbol. We might know it in case we do. That's called tilde, T-I-L-D-A. And I don't know if this is a Greek letter or what, but uh, tilde P is the negation of P. This is how we write the negation of the statement. And just as a remark, uh, we sometimes refer to this as being not P. The negation of P we sometimes refer to as not P. Okay, a little bit more of a review from last time. Okay, some examples here. Let P be the statement 2 plus 2 equals 4. What would the negation of P be? What would you say? Probably you'd say 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. And that is the negation. If this statement is correct, then the statement 2 plus 2 does not equal 4 is false. So if the original statement is true, then the statement 2 plus 2 does not equal 4 is false. Uh, if the original statement were false, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is false, then it must be true that 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. That's how it works. Uh, let's look at another example. Let P be the statement, Birmingham is one of the 50 United States. How would we negate that statement? Probably the easiest thing to do is just insert the word not in here somewhere, right? And if you're thinking along the lines of Birmingham, is not one of the 50 United States. then you're absolutely right. There's a, a quirk that uh, our authors have. Uh, this makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. 
but it's their book and they can put whatever they want into it. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. Uh, if I want to teach something else, I guess I can write my own book, right? But here's a convention that they have in the book. And if we want to get certain homework exercises correct, we better uh, follow their convention. And here it is. Our, our authors have this convention that if P is a simple statement or if P is a compound statement, either one, if P is any statement, then the negation of P is a compound statement. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. But be aware of this convention. Uh, it'll come into play in certain homework exercises in the text. Now, in case you're apprehensive about this, let me assure you, uh, this convention will by no means be an issue on any test that we have. So on any test that we have, the issue of whether the negation of P is a simple statement or a compound statement won't come into play. But I'm just letting you know that our authors do have this convention. Uh, they regard the negation of a simple statement as being a compound statement. Why? I don't know. Just making you aware of it. That's all. Now, let's look at some more examples. Okay, example. Let P and Q be the following. Let P be the statement. I always watch me TV on Saturday night and let Q be the statement. I always eat pizza on Saturday night. Express the following statement symbolically. I always watch me TV on Saturday night and I always eat pizza with an A on Saturday night. Okay. Well, let's look and see what we got here. I always, wa I always watch me TV on Saturday night. That's P, right? And I always eat pizza on Saturday night. We see that right here. That's Q. Huh. <sighs> And what do we do with this thing right here? Well, and is a connective, isn't it? And do we remember how we represent that connective? If you're thinking upside down V, then you're absolutely right. So here's how we represent this statement symbolically. P and Q. So that's our answer right there. Ah, let's do another one of those. Ah, what about this one? Let P and Q be the following. Let P be the statement, we will go to the movies. And let Q be the statement, we will go to the park. Express the following statement symbolically. We will go to the movies or we will go to the park. Now let's diagram this. We will go to the movies. That's statement P, isn't it? And we will go to the park. Well, that's statement Q. And this guy right here or 
how do we represent the connective or? Don't we represent the connective or with this thing that looks like a V? So, symbolically, we represent the given statement as P or Q. And that is our answer. Well, this is good. Let's do another example. Ah, this ought to look familiar. Let P and Q be the following. Let P be the statement, we will go to the movies. Let Q be the statement, we will go to the park. Where have I heard those before? It'll come to me. Express the following statement symbolically. Okay, let's diagram the statement that we have. We will go to the movies. Well, that's statement P, isn't it? So, there's P. And we will go to the park, that's Q. But it doesn't say we will go to the park here, does it? It says we will not go to the park. So, we will not go to the park is the negation of Q, isn't it? So, here, we will write not Q. And the connective or, that's this thing that looks like a V. So, symbolically, we write our statement this way. P or not Q. Now, our book will write it this way just for the sake of avoiding any ambiguity. Uh, if I put a negation in front of a statement, uh, oftentimes I like to put parentheses around it like that, just so that we know exactly what this thing is negating. It's negating the statement Q. Uh, either one is okay. Uh, I have a tendency when I write these things, I like to enclose the negated statement in parentheses just so that we know exactly what's being negated. Well, let's try this thing out for size. Let P and Q be the following statements. P is the statement he did his homework. Q is the statement he went out to play. Express the following statement in words. Not P and Q. Or the negation of P and Q. Well, P is the statement he did his homework. So what would the negation of P be? Maybe he did not do his homework? I think that's what it would be. He did not do his homework. So this is the negation of P, or not P. And we want not P and Q. But this could also represent the word but, right? So here's what I'm going to do. Depending on the context, and may make more sense than but, or the word but may make more sense than and. And then we have Q. He went out to play. So 
So here's our statement Q. He did not do his homework and he went out to play. Or he did not do his homework, but he went out to play. And you know what? Here's one of those situations where maybe uh, the word but fits the context a little bit better than the word and. He did not do his homework, but he went out to play. But either one would be correct. He did not do his homework, but he went out to play. Or he did not do his homework and he went out to play. Either one of those is correct. Uh, given the context of the sentence, I would probably go with the word but. But either one of those is correct. Before we go any further, I'm just going to introduce uh, some formal words in logic. Uh, this word called disjunction is a connective. A disjunction is a connective which joins two sentences. It's represented symbolically by this thing that looks like a V. And in words, it is always expressed using the word or. So the word or is a disjunction. The word conjunction is always represented symbolically by this upside down V. And we've seen that it's expressed in words using the words and most commonly, sometimes using the word but, and much less common, however, and nevertheless. These four words, and, but, however, nevertheless, are conjunctions. Logically, all four of these words have the same meaning. Essentially, they mean and. Uh, the words but, however, nevertheless, have an added connotation, not logically, but just as far as our understanding of the situation. These four words are conjunctions. The word and is most commonly used in place of this symbol, the upside down V. Uh, I'm just giving you a heads up on this that uh, sometimes in our text, the authors will use nevertheless or however, won't happen very often. And the word but won't happen that often. The word and, almost all the time, they'll use and for a conjunction. Suppose we have compound statements involving three or more simple statements. Let's look at the simple statement, P, you will spend six months in jail. Q, you will pay $500 in fines. Uh, R, you will do 10 hours of community service. And we've put these three simple statements together in a sentence and joined them with connectives. Now, how do we interpret this? Let's see. Which connective do we apply first, and or or? Hmm. If we apply and first, then we can group these two together. And it looks like we're being given a choice. We can spend six months in jail and pay $500 in fines. Or we can do 10 hours of community service. 
let's see, spend six months in jail and pay $500 fine, or do 10 hours of community service. Uh, could that really be the intended context of this statement? Uh, if so, and we had a choice between choosing what's in the parentheses or choosing this, we'd be the world's biggest fool not to choose this. We get to choose between spending six months in jail and paying $500 in fines or just doing 10 hours of community service, something we could probably knock out in one day. Uh, seeing as we're given the choice of two sentences here, it seems like the choice would be logically a choice between two things that are, are of equal severity. So it really doesn't look like it makes much sense that these two things should be grouped together and considered first. Let's try grouping these things together in a different way. Let's group these two things together instead. Okay, now we will spend six months in jail and we're either going to pay $500 in fines or do 10 hours of community service. Uh, here, the choice that we have to make is the choice between $500 in fines or 10 hours of community service. Uh, two things that might be roughly the equivalent of one another. So apparently the intended interpretation of this statement is we are definitely going to spend six months in jail. And in addition, we either pay $500 in fines or we do 10 hours of community service. But how do we make that interpretation clear without using parentheses? And the way we do it is we use a comma. And if I put a comma right here, that will indicate that this simple statement stands by itself. And the connective or joins these two simple statements. If I put a comma right here, we have P and Q or R and we we consider this first. We, we consider this logical disjunction first. So symbolically, now that we put the comma in here, we have P and Q or R. Uh, this example illustrates the point that when we use compound statements that involve three or more simple statements, uh, we usually have to use some sort of punctuation to tell us exactly uh, which connection has priority over the others. Uh, this comma indicates that the statement P is set apart by itself and that we are going to apply the conjunction or the disjunction or 
to these two statements first. Uh, let's look at another example. This one's from our text and maybe uh, less dramatic, but maybe a little bit easier to understand. This is probably a good one. P is the statement dinner includes soup. And you know, when most people write the word include, they put an E here. You'll have to forgive me, I never made it past the third grade. Uh, Q is the statement, dinner includes salad. R is the statement, dinner includes the vegetable of the day. So what we have here in terms of P and Q and R, this is P. See, dinner includes salad, that's Q. Dinner includes the vegetable of the day, that's R. Well, how do we interpret this now? Uh, do we put these two together and say P and Q? Or R? So in other words, we'll put the comma here. Dinner includes soup and salad. Or you can get the vegetable of the day. So dinner includes a big bowl of soup and a salad. Or you can get a few uh, chopped carrots. Is that really the connotation that, that they're trying to convey here? I don't really think this is the correct interpretation, but since a comma wasn't inserted in the original statement, uh, there's some ambiguity here. Now, here's what I think they mean. Dinner includes soup and So let me put my comma here. Dinner includes soup. And in addition to the soup, we can either get a salad or the vegetable of the day. And if you think about it, usually that's the offer. Uh, we choose between a salad and the vegetable of the day. But since there wasn't any comma here in the statement originally, there was some ambiguity. But I think what they intend here is for the statement P to stand alone and then be joined to the disjunction of these two statements, Q or R. And the sense of it is dinner includes soup and salad or vegetable of the day. And if that's the case, this is what we would have to do in words. We'd have to insert punctuation. We'd have to put a comma right here. And writing symbolically, we would put Q or R in parentheses. And remember from our algebra, if we have something in parentheses, that means do me first. So we do this first. We choose between Q or R, and then we take that choice and we join it with P. So if we see a comma in a statement involving three or more simple statements, uh, this tells us that what's on one side of the comma is grouped by itself. What's on the other side of the comma is grouped by itself. And that way, there's no ambiguity as to how we interpret the statement. OK, I think we'll call it quits for this lecture. And I will be assigning some homework from section 3.1 along with this.